Welcome. I am Andris Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today we have the privilege of a lecture by Francis Howard. Uh, he is sharing uh, joint work with uh, M.N. Hunkonu and uh, K. Kanyi, and they are of uh, Abawi Kalawi University in Benin. The title of the presentation is Group Algebraic Characterization of Spin Particles, Semi-Simplicity, SO2N Structure, and Iwasawa Decomposition. Uh, Francis Howard is um, defending his PhD this year, uh, and we're delighted to learn about his work. Um, we're looking forward to discussing it after he presents it. Welcome, Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'll begin by sharing my slides. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Andreas. And I'm actually in the faculty of international um, chair for scientific education. That is the for mathematical physics and applications in the Benin at the University of Abomey. So this is a joint work with my supervisors, Mahuton Norbert Hunkonu and uh, Professor Kanji and Kanji Kimbi. So I start. I want to look at the group algebraic characterization of spin particles. And also I will talk about the atomic simplicity, the special octagonal um, structure when it has dimension of 2n. And we'll look at some Iwasawa decomposition of the particle. So, several authors, including Doran, in 1993, showed that every linear transformation can be represented as a monomial of vectors. She did this by looking at every um, Lie algebra as a bivector algebra, and also every Lie group as a spin group. Schringer also, in 1945, including Pauli, work on Pauli, also used the creation and annihilation operators of spin particles and their spatial references to represent the Pauli matrices that we know already. There have been several authors, including um, Sobex, who used, who observed the structure of the spin particles and was able to look at their Grassmannian algebra, including their Clifford algebraic structure. Um, Sobek also wrote a, a proof of the spin half particle in a geometric algebra form. T.D. Palib considered the Lie algebra structure of spin particles. And he looked at how this Lie algebra can be semi-simple. This opened up a lot of ways for several authors, including Schringer, including Ben Hardin and um, Tapan to also look at the parastatistics of the elementary particles, especially dealing with the Fermi-Dirac statistics and the Bose-Einstein statistics and how they are being quantized. Several authors have dealt with this uh, literature or this talk in, into a very much detailed form. But this is what motivates me to look at the algebraic nature. I want to know if the spin in mathematics is the same as the spin particle in physics. Because we are aware of spin group in maths, in geometry. And we also hear of spin particles. I want to see the difference between these two spins. I would also want to check if a spin group in mathematics is a double cover of the special octagonal group, that's SO2, SON group, what will be the cover of spin two, which is in mass? And what will also be the cover of the spin half, which is a particle? I also want to consider if it is possible to con construct the Iwasawa decomposition of a spin particle at both the Lie algebra and the Lie group level. We are already aware that a particle or an elementary particle 
already is a Lie algebra. It has a Lie algebraic structure. But the consequence of the Lie group hasn't much been dealt with. Although in standard model and in gauge groups, it is being used unannounced. It has not been pointed out that the Lie algebra or the Lie algebraic structure of a particle is a Lie group. So this paper sought to motivate the background into this. We shall look at known uh, preliminaries before we get to the main settings of this way. So we look at what a parafermionic algebra is. H.S. Green in 1953 um, stated that when, he, when we have creation and annihilation operators for a system consisting of n fermions, the following commutator relation, that is 3.1, that's bracket of AI negative and bracket of AJ positive, um, that's A dagger plus AJ dagger is equal to the delta of IJ. And he also stated that for the n parafermions, the bracket of the AI negative and the AI positive with the AJ positive or negative is equal to plus or minus two delta of the AJ, of the IJ, AJ positive. This structure just obeys the simple Lie algebraic structure that we have when we consider a vector space G and a bilinear um, form, a bilinear map of this vector space. We just have the bracket of XY giving us XY minus YX. 3.3. Yes. I mean, here you write this A plus minus J, yes. but on the right hand side, you only write A plus J. Is that intentional or should there be also an A plus minus? Okay, so with the A for, for 3.3, 3, right? Yes. The bracket of the A um, minus and A plus, then yeah. a, a, another bracket of A plus or minus J is just doing what we call the, it's, it's using the, the rule of um, canonical um, transformations. And it's just okay. doing what we call the um, Jacobi identity. But here, HS Green utilized this technique to look at the Hoff nature. He, he considered them based on the Hoff nature, okay. the Hoff algebra nature, instead of obeying the Lee structure nature of it. Okay. Yes. But I mean, I'm asking of on the right hand side of this equation, yes. shouldn't it be A plus minus J? A Is plus this... A plus or minus J. Yeah, it should be on the right hand side also A plus minus because then I see, okay, I understand it. If it's only A plus, <laughs> I say I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, what is happening is that with the parafermions, Yes. When um, we look at the creation and annihilation, the, the parafermions um, uses what we call the stringer, um, uh, stringer identities. And when I get to that part, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I uh, presented on the stringer, but what stringer does is that it takes a special reference. So when it is interested in looking at the creation, you only consider the positive, that's the A plus, A dagger of it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look at the annihilations. So its bracket relation only gives us what we are, um, the, the creation we are interested in, but not the annihilated particle, form of the particle. That is what H.S. Green, to my best knowledge, was doing for his, he used that to look at the green, green um, antans, the, Green atoms, like that's that's um, algebraic nature. Okay. Yes. So to some extent, it means that I re don't really understand it, and if I expand it, okay, I might get for something where I have to ask more. So okay, so, but for thank you for clarifying it. Yes. Yes. Yes, but I I, I understand what the question you asked me, mm -hmm. and the way the bracket um, comes forth, but. Um, he he did that. The algebra he used was um, mm -hmm. careful canon, canonical transformations, which obeyed a set of um, 
rules, a set of algebraic bracket mm -hmm. rules before he got to that side. So that side was just what he used for parafemians. We, mm -hmm. And that, that is a structure of a parafemian when we are looking at the half algebraic nature. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I, I am interested in the Lie algebra of that, not only the half structure. That is why I took only that portion. But I think okay. in my um, other works that I have done, it, it is well written. It is well written. Okay, it. I mean, in this article, it was too short, and I was suspecting by yeah. not standing it that it's a typo, but obviously yes. it's not a typo. So, yeah. yes, yes. So for Thank my you, end, brother. it helps me if I think that both sides, to some extent, should apply to the vacuum, and then the yes. creation operator drops out, but the creation operator is left over. That that is that ideally that is what they should have done. I, but I don't know. It rather left the um, operators, the, the plus signs and the minus signs mm -hmm. in front instead of leaving it as a creation or an annihilation. I think it is looking at just the creation side of the paraphernalia. Because when I look at the boson structure, the boson structure also kept the, um, it kept the end when I look at the stringer notation. Stringer used spatial references and he rather kept the minus of it. He also didn't keep the plus, which mm -hmm. which I noticed there is some form of algebra and um, interest, algebra of interest they are, they are looking at. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I think I would look at this um, critically again. When I, 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 I get the chance, I'll just take a look at the permutations of this um, bracket again very well yes. and i mean if if it's aimed now at few physicists which are not that good in mathematics it might be yes. hard to understand and it, an explanation helps them to bridge yes. the gap of unknowledge on my side it's true it's true, it's true. It's yeah. true. It's so true. thank you I'm, I'm really glad in that sense for the clarification what you mean because otherwise yes. i would have left it with oh it's a typo fine Yes. And it's not a type, it's, it's like intentional. That. I That's think the important. physicists are aware of that because um, mm -hmm. they use that structure a lot when they are looking at the octagonal um, projections for monomials. So mm -hmm. They basically use the structure of the HS Green canonical transformation. It's, it's a very old structure. and They've built upon it to develop what we call the um, calculus, boson calculus and uh, calculus of particles and quantum deformations. It has, mm -hmm. They've really used that algebra to build those uh, calculus nature. I think now it's gaining much uh, publicity in uh, physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I basically look at um, the structure of particles to help understand the, the nature or the, the nature of the standard model, because I, I mm -hmm. think the standard model before I could solve the problem, whether there exists a Yamil mass gap, I'll have to know how a particle algebraic structure is like before its interaction with other particles. That okay. is what I seek to um, understand. Mm -hmm. Because I, I believe, um, I, am, I am aware that when an electron and a positron meet. A positron is the anti-electron. And the, an electron which is positive meeting with a positron which neutralizes it mm -hmm. gives off light. And the light is a spin of one, which is a boson. Mm -hmm. So looking at this, a boson has no structure as an electron. A boson is a three by three matrix. Mm -hmm. And an electron is a two by two matrix when it's a spin half. So yeah. looking at this, it gives a lot of mathematical inconsistency. So I'm looking at how I could do this, but I noticed it is true. If I take a two by two matrix, I do the adjoint representation of this matrix. I obviously get a three by three matrix, which is very true. Experimentally, it is true because if it's, yeah. it's obeys the boson, it should give me a three by three structure, which is a boson, which is very true. So I'm working very well to develop extra papers in this field 
to prove that when particles coincide, they give off the lights and the lights has that matrix structure. I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. working hard towards that. It sounds really interesting. And that's yeah. finding a mathematical structure of, well. Of particles. Yeah, and of what basically people were only writing. Okay, we see it, we parameterize it, that's it. And It's true. They, they always uh, conclude. And I, I, I get a bit worried when I see those conclusions because I have to be thinking through their, their statements and be trying to reason. The, I, I basically think it's an experiment that they've done, but I believe that every experiment should not be just of observation. It should be proven with a mathematical rigor. That, that is my belief. It's nice if you can come there. So we, we look at what the parafermionic algebra would yield to. We notice that given any associative free algebra, which is T, these associative free algebra are associated with the, um, the parafermions, or that's the creation and annihilation operators. And from these algebras, we can also have a two-sided ideal, which is denoted by I. We can then form a quotient. That is when we do Lie algebra, we can form a quotient of these um, two different algebras to have the tensor, that is the T of the associative free algebra over the I. This is done when we consider the universal enveloping algebra. And this property is called the parafermi algebra. But the parafermi algebra has this property that they are infinite dimensional. And also it obeys the bracket defined in defined above, that's the bracket of x, y, giving us x, y minus y, x. We consider the definition of semi-simplicity of Lie algebra for the creation and annihilation that was given by T.D. Palif in 1973, 76. T.D. Palif considered n, pairs of creation and annihilation operators. And these n pairs of creation and annihilation operators are contained in a Catan subalgebra, which he denotes by H. The H is a subalgebra. And this subalgebra belongs to the Lie algebra of a particle, that's of, a, of, a, of an elementary spin particle. The Lie algebra in question has a rank n. And the rank n is generated by creation and annihilation operators with respect to its Catan subalgebra. Now, he looked at the root of the vectors. And he noticed that the root of these vectors corresponds to the dual form of the Catan subalgebra, which he denoted by h star of i. From then, we move on to look at what a Clifford algebra is. A Clifford algebra is just the parafermi operator, that is the T over the I, where the T is just the tensor algebra over M and the I is the ideal generated by the elements. We denote the inner product of v, um, v comma v. And also we look at the n as an n-dimensional oriented real vector space. When we do this, we look at the multiplicative multiplication of the Clifford of m, and we denote it by x dot y. We can also look at canonical projections into the odd and the even um, dimensions or degrees of the tensor products. When we consider the basis or the octonormal basis of M, it is possible to look at a linear map and the image of X belonging to the Clifford of M by the linear map 
and denoting it by X bar. This permits us to define what we call the spin group. The spin group, as it is defined in mathematics, is when we take a vector V, the spin group of the V is the X belonging to the Clifford of V. That is the, the, the when we look at this side, the cliff positive of M is the even and the cliff negative of M is the odd degree. So when we look at the spin group, the spin group is taking the X belonging to the cliff positive of V such that the X V and the X image of the X belongs to the V and the X and the X bar also equals to one. This property is just a property of invertibility and it has to be invertible. The X has to be the element in the Clifford has to be invertible in order to obey the spin group in mathematics or geometry. So we know that obviously every spin V or every spin group is a Clifford algebra, which we are aware of. Now, when we take the cliff of V, the cliff of V, we can denote it by cliff of PQ and cliff of RPQ and RPQ over the, which means that is a Clifford over the reals. When we look at a, a, a conjugate of this, which is the, um, the R star of PQ, it is also equal to the cliff PQ, the conjugate of that. And these group are invertible elements of the RPQ. The exponential of Y, any element Y belonging to the cliff of PQ is defined by exponential of Y, which is the summation N equals zero to infinity Y N over N factorial. When we take pi and we let pi be a map from the spin V to the SOV, which is a spectral orthogonal group, we define this by the pi of XV to be XV X, um, X inverse. Then we look at the differential of the pi dot of pi, and we give this differential as the XV minus the VX. This is just obeying the properties of the brackets groups. And we know that the X belongs to the spin of V and the V belongs to the, cap, the, the, the vector V. Small V belongs to the vector V. From this, I am now comfortable to define the spin Lee group and it's look at its Lee algebras. But before that, I will consider M to be, I will assume M to be an oriented manifold. I am careful with the choice of um, assumption because the manifolds I'm talking about has to have a structure that is a space-time structure. It also has to be n-dimensional. It should be compact, para-compact, para-Riemannian manifold or pseudo-Riemannian manifold and should admit a spinner field. And I'm doing this because of the kind of orientation I will set my octonormal co-frames and my frames to when I'm rotating the particle because spins are particle and it deals, we deal with spin when we talk about frames and rotations. So we have Rodrix and Menor defining a spin structure on M consisting of a principal fiber bundle, pi, which is a map from the spin of M to M with a group spin PQ and a fundamental map, which is a two cover fold. So we see for the mapping S, we have the spin of M maps into SO of M, which is a special octagonal group. But here we are considering its frames and we are also considering the octagonal co-frame bundles. So we look at the sections of the um, SOM 
and we also consider the sections of the spin M. And we look at it octagonal frames differing by two pi rotations, which are distinct. Now, these conditions would only be true. This will only be true if it satisfies the conditions below. That is, if pi is a projection map of the bundle. And that is if also the adjoint of the spin moves into the automorphism of the Clayford algebra and the adjoint of U that with respect to U is the cliff, the real form of the cliff PQ, that's the RPQ into the U X U inverse, which belongs to the cliff of PQ. Now, in that case, we have our diagram commutes. We have that the spin frames moves to the special octagonal group frames, which also maps to the base. That is the Riemannian manifold M. This structure is what helps us to see the bundle on a particle or the spin structure of a particle. So Miller and Rodrix also considered a definition saying that a spin manifold is an orientable manifold M together with a spin structure on the tangent bundle of M. Now, a spin group is generally defined to be a compact dimensional Lie group because of its association with a spectral octagonal groups. Now, we, mo we move on to the spin Lie groups. In particles, we are aware that the Lie algebra, which I, I denote by spin J of the particle can be identified or represented by classical matrices. So when I take the spin J for a particle which is a Higgs boson, I state that the quantum state of the particle J is zero, which is very true from experiment that the Higgs boson has a quantum state to be zero. When I take the spin J, which is a fermion, I consider only odd integers and this odd integers must be a half. So I consider half odd integers. And all this obeys the Fermi Dirac statistics, which makes them a fermion, half integral particle. When I consider the, bo the bosons, the bosons in general are integers. And integers ranging, that's the set of Z, for positive integers. I do not consider negative integers in this um, particle situation. Um, there are other studies that I'm looking into to see where the dual form of the boson can be and how the structure of the dual will be. But for now, I only consider the positive spin, integer spins for, for elementary particles. Now the Lie algebra SL2N can, be repre can represent the fermion. And this is done because when I take the, the odd half integer, which is Z over two, I can put it in this form, 2K plus one over two, where my K starts from zero till infinity. Although we are aware that particles has to be discovered, it has to be discovered by experiment. We, we are mostly aware that a lot of particles have been discovered already. Now, the Lie algebra or the Lie group structure, SL2N, can represent the fermion. And this is done when we consider the, the sequence, SL2N mapping to the, Z, the spin of Z over two, the half integral spin, and also to fermion. I consider these cases because of the gauge theory or the standard model, where I look into the short exact sequences of particles or the gauge groups. So for a boson, classical Lie structure, which is the SL2N plus one, which maps into the Z 
then the spin, the spin of integers, which also maps to the boson. Now, when you look at the diagram, we have the standard model of elementary particles. And every particle would have to fall under these three categories. It has to be first a Higgs, a fermion, or a boson. So if these particles obey this structure, then they would obey the exact algebra sequence that we have presented earlier. Now, before moving on to the semi-simplicity of particle, I considered, we, sh we shall consider the SU2 and the Wenger rotations. This has been done by Ben Hardin, Ben Dierhan, sorry, and the uh, Holman. And a lot of books have also done this angular momentum coupling, where we take the, 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 the we take for electrons, when we consider two electrons, we take the quantum state of those two electrons. We can couple the electrons using angular momentum, and they must obey these um, three sets of equations. That is S square cat bracket of SM is equal to X bracket of X plus one, Planck's constant square cat bracket of SM, and the SZ cat bracket of SM, which equals M H cat bracket, that the H is the Planck's constant, the reduced Planck's constant, cat bracket of SM. And also the S plus or minus obeying the equation 3.10. This can help us to look at, to stick a unitary transformation. And this unitary transformation can be represented in some form of klebsch gordon coefficient. The klebsch gordon coefficient of these can be obtained when we consider um, the Wenger coefficient or the, the rotations of particles using the Raka, the Raka or the Wenger form. In advanced forms, we consider the 3J, the 9J, the 6J, the 12Js. That is when we deal with topology and um, advanced forms of particles or angular momentum coupling. I have considered that in other cases, but not in this situation. So now we will look at semi-simplicity of spin particle. Now the spin particle has, we've already discovered, it is having um, the Lie algebraic structure. And this Lie algebra, in order to perform Iwasawa decomposition in future, that is in this talk, we would have to make it semi-simple. But T.D. Palif, as we have observed in our preliminary talk, looked at the Lie structure of the particle of the creation and annihilation, which are semi-simple. So based on that, we have the following lemma, that any spin particle, Lie algebra, admits a Clifford algebra and a spin group structure. The proof of this lemma, sorry for the quotation marks, I don't know why it appeared like that, but this proof is when we consider this, the Lie structure, spin J of a particle, and we look at the quantum um, J, that is zero, half, one, when we consider the Higgs, fermion, boson, or all those um, states, we use the commutator and anti-commutator relations that we showed under the N para fermions and fermions, as well as the spin Lie commutator brackets rule, we see that the Lie algebra J is a Clifford algebra. And the spin J is just the exponential form of the, when we take the exponential form of the Lie algebra, we get the spin group, which is the spin of J. Now, this spin J is now the spin group. And it is obvious that the spin particle admits a spin group from this lemma. We move ahead to lemma two, which says that any spin group of a spin particle admits an almost complex spin manifold, which is a Riemannian manifold, and a spin Lie group structure. From the lemma one above, we admitted that the spin particle is a spin group. Then from 
the definition of a spin group that we have considered previously. The spin J has a group structure which is almost complex. That is when we look at the co-frames and the frames of the spins, looking at the fiber bundles. And the definition that we know from the spin group, the spin of V, would help us to notice this realization that a spin J admits a spin manifold based on the, um, the, the uh, main law and uh, Rodrick's definitions. Next, we can also see that the spin particle um, has a spin manifold. Then if it has a spin manifold, it is easy to say that the spin J is a spin group and hence a spin Lie group. So the term spin Lie group came from the lemma two of our um, work. Now, when we look at preposition one, preposition one is if we have any spin half odd integer, respectively the integer spin, Lie group, this Lie group is a fourfold cover of the compact group, which is SO2N, and a double cover of the SO2N plus one. So if it is a spin half odd integer, which is a fermion, it is a fourfold cover. But if it is a boson, it is a double cover. And these covers are all you know, compact Lie groups. So we consider the proof of this, which is straightforward. The fermion quantum states, which is a spin J, when I consider fermions, can be the spin of Z integer over two. That's the half integer, half odd integers. And this has a, 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 a sequence, which is the special linear group of order two. That's a complex form mapping into the spin, um, half integer of the spin and into the SO2 N, which is the special orthogonal group of dimension 2N, where SO2N conserves its quadratic form in the complex um, 2N dimensions. We also see that the compact Lie group SO2N is fourfold connected. And this has been proven in the books of Helgasen. He proved it looking at the Catan list. Catan also proved it in, in, in his um, work showing that the SO2N, which is a compact Lie group, is fourfold connected. And it has a center, which is Z4. And when we consider the odd dimensions, it, we get a Z4. And when we consider even dimensions, we have Z2 by Z2. Since the spin odd half integer is a fermion with Z as an odd integer, the diagram must commute. We have the SL2N maps into the spin half odd integer. This maps into the SO2N. And we also have the SU2N map into the SL2N. The SU2N star is the special unitary group. But there is a star because the, this is coming from the complex form of the special unitary group of dimension 2n. If we weren't considering the complex form, we would have just used the usual notations in Helgasen, which is SU2n. But Catan used the SU star 2n to represent the, the complex form of that metric structure. And this maps to the fermions. So every fermion, no matter how it looks like, would have this structure. When we put n to be any number, as we have in our notations, we would see the details of that proof below. We'll be able to state that it's categorically a fermion, fermionic structure. Now, when we look at the SO2N plus one, that is the, bos the, the boson. The boson has the group, the classical metric structure, that is special linear group of order 2N plus one. Mapping into itself, that's the spin of Z, the boson of integers, the spin of integers, and the SO2N 
plus one structure. This SO2N also conserves its quadratic form in the complex 2N plus one dimensions. And these are compact groups, but these are only double connected. And they have a center of Z2. The bosons must commute when we consider this diagram. The SL2N plus one maps into the Z, the spin of integers, which maps into the SO2N plus one, which maps into which are all bosons. And these are all bosons. So this is how the typical bosonic structure of a particle looks like. And even when we consider the Higgs boson, where the N is, um, is starting from a zero, we consider the Higgs structure where the N is starting from a zero. Hold on, sorry. This will still yield the usual um, bosons that we have. Yes. Now, I move to theorem one. Theorem one says that any spin lead group, spin J of a spin particle is connected one. Semi-simple, if and only if its simple roots are one of the Denkin's root system if and only if its simple roots, sorry, are one of the Dinkins root system. If and only if its simple roots are one of the Dinkins root system. Associate, that is the pi of Bn and the pi of Dn associated with the classical groups SO2n plus one and SO2n. Now, when we consider root systems, we look at, the root structure or the complete octagonal set form structure of the classical groups, that's SO2N plus one and SO2N. And these are associated with the Dinkins roots, that's the pi of BN and the pi of DN. And these structures are what makes the fermion and the boson. So for a proof of this, I considered a structure of the quantum state of a particle when it is j, when j is zero, j is half, and j is one. So respectively, when we have j to be zero, the zero con corresponds with the dimension of one when n is one. So a special linear group of order one, and this is obviously the SO one. It has the SO one structure when we consider the complex case or the unitary case, it will have the U1, U1 structure. That's the unitary group of order one structure. And this is called the Higgs boson. When my dimension is, when I consider the integer half, that's the spin one over two, and my dimension of N is one, I obviously have the SL2C, which is a special linear group of order Two, and this corresponds to the compact group, compactly group that is SO two structure in classical matrices, and this is a fermion. So, with this case, I have been able to see that my spin half is a compact Lie group, which is a rotational form, and it corresponds to the classical Lie group, which is the SL two C. The same thing is done for the spin one. And for, for physicists, they are aware that a spin one has a three by three matrix structure. So the spin one, when N is of dimension one, we have from this side, we have SL two N plus one. If N is one, we have SL three and SL three, corresponds to the compact rotation form, which is SO3. And when we look at the, the unitary form of it, it is easy to see that it would have um, a structure that corresponds to the spin one. And these are all bosons. Helgastin has proving that the SO1, SO2, and SO3 are all connected Lie groups.
it will be okay if I pause here for a question. If there's a detailed question for me, I can pause here for it. Any questions, Thomas, or comments? I think this is more clear than the one question that I had before. Uh, to some extent, I would remark that, I mean, when we describe now the bosons, for instance, the vector bosons, they should live in the adjoint representation. Yes. Or well, how we describe them is now as a vector in SO3. Okay. So no. at least that, that's how I would get it. And then all the yes. things that are written up to make intuitive sense. I mean, it seems like, yes, there is something true written up and should be understandable. So I hope that Andrus can follow this intuition too, because it might help to clarify what, well, how we see the particles. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so maybe um, I will dare to ask a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so the okay. first question will be, um, you speak of almost complex spin manifolds. And so what is meant yeah. by almost complex? Okay, with the almost complex structure, we talk about what we call the, um, it, it, it behaves that like the Kalihani manifold or the pseudo Romanian manifold. So these structures, are not fully a Riemannian manifold, but they have some structure of a Kalihali manifold, which makes them a pseudo Riemannian. So we we state them as almost complex manifold. That that is how uh, Minlaw and Rodrix uh, puts the definition for almost complex manifold. Thank you, and then. Yeah, um... In the diagram that you have here, yes. uh, you spoke about the difference between uh, fourfold uh, and twofold um, yes. covers. Yes. And so, is it possible referencing these diagrams to explain mm -hmm. that? And also, you have the arrows pointing into uh, fermion or pointing into boson. Yes. And so, what is meant by that? Because that it suggests that they're mathematical structures. Okay, so what is meant by this are uh, what we have proven here. Let me check if I can verify this for you. I think it would have been clear from the next stage as 21. Yes, 21. So from this, that's that. Okay, I would have clarified this section from that side, from this side, that the results of what I just showed, the example of the spin zero, spin one, and the spin half can be extended to all elementary particles. So when we take a fermion and a boson spin lead group, the fermion are fourfold connected and double connected as we saw in proposition one. Then this, for, for the spin lead groups, that is the spin, half, which is a four-fold cover. The SO2 is a compact lead group, while the spin one is a double cover of the SO3, which is also a compact lead group. Now, T.D. Palif has already shown us previously that the creation and annihilation operators generates the semi-simple Lie algebra G of rank N and it gives a direct sum decomposition of these classical algebras by breaking them down into BM1 to BMK, where the, where the M1 to MK are the ranks, the N. And these operators are isomorphic, he stated, which is true by proving that this, um, this particle with the semi-simple gene of rank N are isomorphic to the classical groups that is the bn with a complete octagonal with a complete system of roots octagonal with respect to the killing form so he considers the killing forms of these um, particles by looking at their Lie algebra structure considering the adjoints as um, dr 
Thomas said, he looked at the adjoint representations. Then these adjoint representations can be found in the classical groups BN. And the BN are the Dinkins roots. But he further stated that when he considered the bracket relations of, the, of, of these um, Dinkins roots, and also look at the correspondence of his Lie algebras, they are similar to that of the system of roots that has been um, done by Eugene Dinkin. And the system of roots are just the classical, are just corresponding to the classical groups SO2 and, and SO2 and plus one. So when I say that a particle is a boson, I mean that this boson is linking to the roots system, which is, um, that, that is the Dinkins root system, which is the DN. Then when I say a particle is a fermion, I mean it is linking to the Dinkins root, which is BN. So my DN is SO2N plus one for my boson, and my fermion is SO2N. That's the even special orthogonal group. So wh while I write the boson fermions, I just mean that the particle is connected to the Dinkins root, which is SO2, which has a classical form, which is SO2N and SO2N plus one. So for any boson, I will make it SO2N plus one. Then for a fermion, I'll make it SO2N. And so that suggests to me that when you're speaking about root systems, you're also <laughs> able to speak about them as uh, Lie algebras, you know, in the context Absolutely. of Lie algebras. And so these maps yes. are making sense also yes. from the point of view of Lie algebras. Is that yes, correct? Yes. Very Thank correct. You. Very correct. Welcome. So from, from then, we have observed that the SL, the Lie algebra of the special linear group can be decomposed into the compact real forms. That is the SU2 Lie algebra and the imaginary form, the ISU2 or the SL2 real form and the I of the SL2. What is the, the I, the SL2 real form is the special linear group of order two, which is real, having real, dimensions of real um, matrices. Then the complex form is the SL2C. Pauli was able to look at this structure to get his matrices. I, I am interested in looking at the real structure of a spin half. It is true Pauli got his structure from, his inspiration from this, but I'm interested in the real form of these um, structures, which have been done in Lie groups. Let me try to move to the next slide. I think my, okay, so, okay, so this leads me to preposition two. For preposition two, we are looking at the real Lie algebra. We say that the real Lie algebra of a spin half, of any spin half particle, of a spin particle is given by that is spin half is equal to S belonging to the two by two real matrix such that the trace of the X is equal to zero. And this form have element basis, which have SK. I labeled it SK, S depth, which is already known and familiar with, we are familiar with S depth and S plus. So S plus are the um, creation of rates. And the SK are the, what we call the SK belongs to the um, compact form. In future, we will see that the SK belongs to the compact form. I labeled it SK for um, specific um, references. Now, this obeys the commutator relation below. And carefully, if we look at the, the, Lie, the bracket structure of the Lie group that we are already aware of when we take the Lie group G having a bilinear map and looking at it, Jacobi's skew symmetric property, we, it would obey strictly the real form of the spin half. 
So the proof of this was done by taking the arbitrary angular momentum of any spin half with a thinnest um, chi of chi, which is equal to the vector AB, and giving us that. This is really done in angular momentum coupling. And we we, we take the x of the the s of the x, which is the lowering operator, the raising operator plus the lowering operator divided by two. We take the S Y, that's the Y form, the Y direction of the vector, which is the raising operator minus the lowering operator divided by the two I. And this can be coupled using the angular momentum coupling that I showed from the Ben Hardin and the Holman, Ben Dierhan and the Holman approach. We can have two by two matrices. These two by two matrices has an identity matrix, which is I. And it also has the S, the SZ. The SZ is a directional form, which is also um, one, zero, zero minus one. And it's a diagonal element. We notice that the diagonal of this element are, are what? Uh, positive and negative. Now, it is true that the trace of this will always be zero. From this, we notice the definition of the real league will say that the trace must be zero. When we take the trace of this two by two matrix as that, we get a zero. When we take the trace of the S plus, which is the raising operators, it is also going to give us zero. Obviously, when we take the trace of the SK, now my SK is living in my SY. In my SY, I'm able to to factor out the complex i minus i out. And when I factor out the minus i from my xy matrix, I get what we call the sk. And this sk, looking at the matrix structure carefully, is having a structure of entries of 0, 1, minus 1, and 0. What is, is giving us the, the rotational form of the, the, the vector of the spin particle. Now, from that proposition, we can have a lemma, which says that for any spin half, there exists an octagonal skew symmetric matrix element, SK, which can be transformed into an SO2 compactly group for any element G belonging to, for any element G belonging to the SL2 are the special linear of order two and the stabilizer of I under the action of G is the subgroup K, where K is the SO2, that's the compact form. The proof of this was just, is just straightforward. And we just take the, S, the SK and do an exponentiation of the SK matrix. When we do an exponentiation of the SK matrix, we notice that we have the cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. And this is just a rotational matrix, which is compact. And it's a compact subgroup. We shall see the nature of the compact subgroup when we get to the Iwasawa decomposition. Now, based on this lemma and proposition, I remarked that the compact real form of a spin half is the spin r one over two plus the i spin r one over two because the spin Lie group itself is a Lie algebra, but it's a complex Lie algebra. So when we complexify the Lie algebra of the spin half, we end up getting the real form that's the spin r one half plus the imaginary form, that's the I spin half, um, spin R one half, one, one over two. Now, for notational sake and for semi-simplicity, in the next sections, I put most of my plants, I'll put my plant constant H to be one. I'm, I'm talking about this H to be one because when we look at my matrices, you notice the Planck's constant h bar was throughout the matrices. Now, this is because every particle 
can be can have an electromagnetic field depending on its structure when it is not an isospin. But when it's an isospin or isospin, its electromagnetic structure has been switched off or turned off. And it behaves like the normal matrices that we know, with the Planck's constant being one. But when its magnetic field is active, it has to have the Planck's constant, which makes it a spin or a particle. If not, obviously, I don't see a particle without a magnetic field being a particle. I still see them as classical matrices and it have it just has mathematical structure without any um, difficulty to deal with. Now, so from may, then- May I yes. interject because yes. this may be the key point and maybe I understand it, but- uh, Yes. When you explained to me your talk, you said that you would be talking about the difference between mathematical spin and physical spin. Yes. And Absolutely. is this the difference? This is one of the difference. Okay. Because the math spin has a Planck's constant, which makes it, it has a Planck's constant, which makes it uh, quantized. The Planck's constant is for quantization. And it's an electromagnetic field. When it is turned off, we have the classical matrices or the isospins. And isospins don't need um, electromagnetic field. They can be reacting based on strong interactions when we come to um, particle interactions. That is when the bonding, it has strong interactions without an, a, an electromagnetic uh, presence. So from this, we now get to the Iwasawa decomposition of the spin half particle. For this decomposition, the, the tools or the ingredients needed is the spin, the Lie algebra of the spin half must be semi-simple. If it is not semi-simple, it can never perform Iwasawa decomposition. And Iwasawa decomposition is a strong tool in spherical Fourier, Fourier transforms. We use that tool in Jerka uh, Fourier transforms and Hanrich Chandra models and Hanrich Chandra universal enveloping algebra. It's a very strong tool also in Piadics, L addicts, and also in Zeta and string theory. So I will perform the Iwasawa for a particle. So I look at, I consider theta t and xi to be arbitrary real numbers. Now these real numbers, I put Planck's constant of k theta to be exponential of theta sk, the Planck's constant of dt half to be exponential of czx, and the Planck's constant of n xi to be the exponential of xi x plus. Then the subgroups, mm -hmm. h power three, kdn, where k is a compact subgroup, d is a diagonal or the um, symmetric or abelian subgroup, and n is the nipotent or the ladder operators subgroup of the spin half are defined by the h k theta to be that, the HD, capital D, to be that, where T belongs to the real number. The real number, I used the usual R, but I, I, I think in my article, is it has been well written as the real number, the R form. Then the H of the nil potents, the Planck's constant nil potents, to be that. Now, the HK theta, we can have this subgroup, the cos theta over the cos theta over two, sine theta over two, sine theta over two, and cos theta over two minus sine theta and cos theta over two. Now for the diagonal dt half, we can also have this. Then for the nil potent, we have an upper triangular matrix, which is having zeros in the in the lower side, and the upper side has the elements there. And this K is isomorphic to the R or the torus 
is isomorphic to the torus. And the D is isomorphic to the real numbers and also the N to also real numbers. Now, any spin half particle is uniquely decomposable in the form I combined, in this case, Iwasawa decomposition is very straightforward, but I combined the angular momentum coupling to make it more appealing for physicists. So it can be decomposed into K, D, and N. The Planck's H cube being there, where the uh, where we have the exponential of theta, S K, exponential of T, S Z, and exponential of psi S plus. For the next section, I I am I, I used basically the H in this um, slide. But in my original work, I placed the H to be, the Planck's constant to be one. This is because the presence of the Planck's constant in this decomposition wouldn't do anything to it because I'm looking at the algebraic structure, the metric structure. So if I even put the Planck's constant to be one, I get back to the usual form of the Iwasawa decomposition, which is in the classical case. Now, the following results can be easily obtained. We have the exponential of i theta over 2, exponential of t, and the xi to be that. From this, I did a proof by taking exponentiation of the sk, which is the sk matrix, and get coming out with the uh, the rotational form cos theta over 2 sin theta over 2 minus sin theta over 2 cos theta over 2. And by isomorphism showing that it is a torus. Now, I also considered the diagonal element, which is the SZ. The diagonal element of the matrix, when we exponent, we find the exponentiation of it with respect to T, we get E T over 2, 0, and E negative T over 2. And this is also isomorphic to the real number that we know, that um, we, we are aware of. This is because the raising, this is because the diagonal element is abelian or symmetric, skew symmetric, if I may put it. It is symmetric, not skewed. It is symmetric because of its abelian nature. Now, I look at the raising operators and I do similar thing by finding the exponential form of it. And that gives me the upper triangular metric that I have over there. When I consider the product of all these with respect to the general form of a two by two matrix, which is A, B, C, D, I can get my components A to be that, my C to be that, and my A minus IC to be this. When I take the modulus of the A minus IC, I easily get the form of my xi that I want to obtain in the Iwasa decomposition. This decomposition gives us many um, tools to deal with the spherical fluid transforms of a particle or the hand measure of a particle, or, look at, or to look at the geometric structure of a particle when we want to um, do higher uh, physics or higher mathematical um, consequences with these. Now, we know that the spin half is spanned by two states. That is the one half, one half, and the one half minus half from the angular momentum where momentum coupling that we I showed by the Hallman and the Bendier hand. Mm -hmm. We use this same approach to see if it is possible to compute the angular momentum of 3 over 2, 5 over 2, to infinite dimension. So I gave a general question which proves into the general form of the angular momentum of a spin half particle. So what can the general term, that's the last term of a spin half integer be? From theoretical point of view, this can be useful for the study of particle rotational form, because I'm always interested in the rotational form of the particle. So these are the results that we obtain. That for any quantum, for any spin 2n minus 1 over, over 2, that's a fermion, quantum state, 
where n is one, two, three to infinity, we have the following. The angular momentum, that's the f squared, cat bracket of sm to the nth dimension. I was interested in the nth dimension. It's equal to four n squared minus one over four, h squared, that's the Planck's constant squared, cat bracket of sm. Then the direction, magnitude of direction, that is the sd of the cat bracket of sm is equal to plus or minus 2n minus k over 2 h cat bracket of sm, where k is less than or equal to 2n, and where n is 1, 2, 3 to infinity, and k is only odd integers, 1, 3, 5, and so on, because I'm considering fermions. Then, the end possible state of a spin particle can be given as 2s plus 1. And this can be further reduced to 2n, where n is 1, 2, 3. The quantum state of, this, of the fermion is spanned by 2n states from that. And we have the state showing where k is one, three, five to infinity, and k is less than two n, less than or equal to two n. From this, the ladder operators x plus will act on will act on the quantum states as follows. When we act with the s plus, we act on the quantum states. We get the equation six point eight, and when we act with the x plus, we act on the the quantum state, we get the 6.9. We should note that as I showed in the, the real Lie algebra, the lemma three, we should know that the xy is equal to x plus minus x, um, is equal to x, the lowering operator, the raising operator minus the lowering operator of the, over the two i where I factored out the SK. So I use that same technique for this SK in the nth dimension. This is because I'm considering the rotational form in the nth dimension because of the Dinkins roots system. Now, from this, I have the following theorem that for any spin 2n minus one over two, the quantum state of the particle is spanned by two n states, and there exists octagonal matrix element Sk in the Sy, which I showed you just recently, matrix, which can be transformed into the classical group SO2n with natural numbers, n equals one, two, to infinity. This compactly group SO2n corresponds to the Dinkins root system that I proved in theorem, in the theorem above and in proposition one. In theorem one and in proposition one. The proof of this is straightforward. And um, if we, if, if, since we observe from the, the rotational form that I proved for the SK, I had SO2, which is a compact subgroup. And this compact subgroup has been shown in the Iwasawa decomposition, which is this element, cos theta over two, sine theta over two, minus sine theta over two, cos theta over two, which is a torus. And this is the same element, is the same form of the SK, but in the nth dimension. So for the nth dimension, we have an SO2n. And the SO2n is the Dinkin, it corresponds to the Dinkin's root, which is the pi of the dn. In, in roots in this uh, in Catan roots systems. Now, from this, we have. May I interrupt? Uh, yes. Yes, if you go back to that slide. Just so yes. I'm just, I am understanding about 25%, and you're helping okay. me reach 35%, I think. But okay. so I'm just uh, trying to see if I'm hanging in there. But the relationship between the Lie group SO2n and the Dinkin root system for Dn, that's part of the classification. Mm -hmm. But what is uh, actual here in the theorem four mm -hmm. is that there exists an orthogonal mm -hmm. matrix element. Yeah. So that yeah. this is 
This is allowing for this decomposition. Is that what I'm Absolutely. Saying? Okay, I understood Absolutely. that much. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very true because the Dinkins roots are actually um, systems of roots that are finite dimensional Lie algebras. In the classical cases, we have the oh, SU. And oh, I missed that. The, the Dinkins root is for the Lie algebra, and then this is the yes. corresponding Lie group. Yes, absolutely. but still, that's part of the classical theory. Um, it's, it's and what you're what you're saying is that uh, you get this um, in your decom. You will have a, this as part of your decomposition. That's absolutely. what you're saying. Be okay. because it is um, a compact form. So when you decompose any particle, you have the subgroup which is compact. You have the abelian and the nilpotent, which is a uh, raising operator. Triangle, upper triangular matrix. Yes. Now from then, from there we come to a proposition by Segura, but um, I lifted the case to spin particles to look to see how a spin particle could look at that. For any elements G in the real form of the spin half, where theta is also real, we let G K theta to be K D and N. Now you've noticed that I'm, I'm multiplying, I'm finding the product of the group, the product of the Lie group, G, with the compact subgroup, K theta. So we have the cos theta sine theta minus cos th minus sine theta cos theta multiplying the Lie group G. And this gives also another form of Iwasawa decomposition because it is still compact, with kg theta diagonal or abelian with dt of um, dt half and nine potents, which is also that form. Now, with this form, when I put the Planck constant to be a one, the h to be a one, I have the following co cycle conditions hold. This is because the real form of the spin half particle. It's a subset of the special octagonal Lie group because it's a two by two matrix. And the two by two matrix is always a special linear group of order two. So from there, the following conditions are obeyed, which are co cycle. Then we also have that if G belongs to the matrix, two by two matrix ABC, then it is possible to look at the form that we, we considered in the Wasa decomposition in an extended form in this case and get the following results. This was a beautiful proof done by, um, it's a Gura, that is a Gura in 1977. And he used that a lot in his uh, compact um, transformations. Now, the main theorem of this paper is the theorem of particle decomposition. The question is, if I can perform an Iwasawa decomposition on a particle, where the Planck constant is one, I get Iwasawa decomposition. What is a general form or what is the general decomposition of every spin particle? And this case can be noted when we look at this. Any spin Lie group G can be uniquely decomposed in the form G is equal to the celeric, that's the fine structure constant symbol, is the Russian symbol. I think you better, you best understand this symbol than myself. The K, which is the compact, the D, which is the diagonal or the rotational function, with S being the spin or the quantum state of the spin, and the N being the nilpotent or ladder operators. Now, the fine structure constant, and it's just like the Planck constant that we used. But over here, my argument is that every particle of matter has some form of a constant. And this constant, no matter what we do with the particle, will always exist. The Planck constant, when the particle is quantized, it 
gives us the plants constant. But even in the form of hydrogen, when um, Sommerfeld considered the hydrogen of an electron, the hydrogen structure of an atom, sorry, hydrogen structure of an atom, he was able to observe that this structure have the Planck's constant. So it means Planck's constant, it has the, what we call the fine structure constant. So it means the fine structure constant cannot be done away with when we are considering magnetic field of particles and the directions that the particles should go. So I pick a general form of a particle. When I say a spin half, I mean electrons, protons, leptons, quarks, all those fermions that are having a spin structure of one half. All this structure are having some form of electromagnetic field. Even that of the spin bosons, Higgs, they all have some form of st um, structure constant. In Lie algebra, the structure constant are just some coefficients that are calculated by mathematicians. But in particle physics, I don't think this will just be a coefficient because in an experimental lab, just an effect or an event where a, a particle coefficient perturbs the experiment can change the results totally in nature. So this general form of decomposition helps us understand how a particle behaves. For the proof, I just gave a physical interpretation and a sketch of it. I consider the Iwasawa decomposition of an electron, and an electron has a spin half. Suppose the electron is at rest in a homogeneous magnetic field. Its eigenfunctions do not depend on its position, because we are looking at the position of the electrons. So given mu, the magnitude of the ball magneton, and h, the Hamiltonian, one then obtains the system of equations which are given as follows. Now we find out that the energy, that's E, is equal to plus or minus mu of the H, the modulus of the H. If we denote the angle between the field direction and the Z axis by theta, and we normalize the, um, we normalize our alpha beta in this way, the normalization, is strictly done when we are considering the rotational, that's the compact form, the K subgroup of the Iwasawa decomposition of the octagonal group. The compact form, which is the cos, the sine, and the negative sine, the cos, we find the um, trace of this, and the trace of this gives us what we call one. That is cos squared theta plus sine squared theta, given one. And this is just the exact normal form when we are dealing with an electron that has been normalized. Now from this, one can suddenly rotate the external magnetic field in the direction of Z, where the cos squared theta over two is the fraction of the electron with moments that are directed parallel to the Z axis. And the sine squared theta over two is the fraction of the electron with moments that are directed anti-parallel to the z axis and vice versa. This technique was used by Pauli when he was considering his um, Pauli matrices. That is how he came about with his matrix. So I further went ahead and said, okay, Pauli said that no two electrons can fill the same shell according to his principle in um, physics. Then, is it possible I can decompose a particle in that way? Let me see how possible it will be. So I noticed this principle obeys the, the Iwasawa decomposition. Pauli's exclusion principle obeys just this decomposition that I'm doing. Now, I decided to consider the subgroup, which is the D. The DS is the diagonal or the abelian subgroup. But I did it in the general form by not considering it to just be abelian and symmetric or diagonal. This is because 
the symmetric form or the diagonal form of the spin particle leads us to what we call the uh, what we call the klebsch golden coefficient or the Wenger form of the klebsch golden coefficient. Mm -hmm. And these rotations are not just simple to deal with. It is simple when we consider the case when the spin is a half spin. But when the spin is not a half spin, it is never an abelian or just a symmetric decomposition. It goes beyond that. So I consider this case where my ds, where my um, ds of ds of t, where t belongs to r, with a ds of t belonging to dt with ds. That is where my uh, notations with a dt of half k. Now I consider the klebsch gordon coefficient of this form, rotational forms, and I use the campbell hausdorff equation or campbell hausdorff formula to do the commutator relations. Look at the exponential of i of t k y k z of exponential of i negative i t k y, and this gives this gave me the cosh of t with that. This has been done rigorously by um, by the, um, how the, his name is then the pronunciation of name is a, a very big um, difficulty for me because it's spelled with um, U I. I don't know why. That, yes, and it it has been done by that author rigorously. And taking the matrix element of this, it is possible to expand using recurrent formula of the D function when we consider the finite 2x plus 1 dimensional case to have that equation 7.4. And this equation 7.4 leads us to the D functions of the SU1 matrix. So we have moved from a spin half or a spin particle, and we have seen that the spin particle is having, for an electron spin half, having a compact subgroup, now has a rotational form which is isomorphic to SU1. And this SU1, rotational forms, we will further see that it's having poly, it's having the um, Jacobi polynomials. Mm. These Jacobi polynomials, yes. You wanted to ask something? I will ask something later because Jacobi polynomials are orthogonal polynomials. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And then we'll be able to discuss this later, but I'll hold on yes. for now. Yes, yes. This has the Jacobi polynomials. And in the rotational form of the DS, we have the Koch, the Sanch with the Jacobi polynomials. Now, when I consider the case where my, my S is equal to a half, I get the abelian subgroup in the Iwasawa decomposition, which is the DT of half that we previously saw. Finally, the Newpotent structure which is the K plus, that's the um, raising operator. In the two-dimensional non-unitary representation, it's, non it's a non-compact operator, but this generates the elements of the parabolic subgroup of U1, the parabolic subgroup of U1, of, of the SU1, sorry. Now, if you would want to ask a question before I move to why the difference between math and physics Thanks. Thomas, any questions? No, but I'm starting to get uh, lapses of attention because it's overloading. <laughs> but yes. I guess yes. that's understandable when you present a whole thesis in mm -hmm. one first attempt. Yes. Well, I, I will have some questions um, at this point, yeah. I think. Um, yes. And um, so maybe... Um, these are things, of course, I noticed, um, and uh, I am just want to applaud uh, your uh, knowledge and your scholarship. Uh, uh, but so these are ideas that were sparked. On slide 30, uh, you don't have to go there, but uh, there were three parameters. Two were real numbers, and one was uh, circular. And so yes. I would imagine that becomes a cylinder. And I was wondering yes. if the cylinder uh, has... Any relevance, if I understood correctly, like, you know, would, would, does there any significance to such a yeah. cylinder? So, 
That is the torus. Yes. Oh, it's a um, torus, but is a torus. Well, a torus would have uh, two hole, circles. Yes, two circles with a hole in one. Yes. So theta is a circle, but what else is a circle? Is it? We say what else is a circle? Yes, I thought that the t is a real number and psi is a real number. Yes. So psi, I, psi is a real number. The d that's the diagonal is a real number, but the k, the k is isomorphic to a torus. It is the theta, which is a real number in the in the k. It's just the theta. Okay, so then I'll have to think about that because, but but if yes. I have the theta, yes. Well, it will make a cylinder, right? That part will make a cylinder. Two real numbers in it, but then it's folded further mm -hmm. because if you said the K, yes. is that correct? Yes. That's the, yes. Okay, so it is a yes. cylinder, but it becomes a torus. It's, it's a torus, yes. Okay, so then I, I think I'm understanding better. Another question, uh, and maybe I'll just say it now and maybe I'll return to it later, but uh, I'm just fascinated by these uh, decompositions and in studying this, and you may have mentioned to this to me, but um, in matrix algebra, linear algebra, we have uh, decompositions into, for example, a yes. uh, rotation and then a, yeah. let's say, a collapse. So like Gram-Schmidt uh, orthogonalization Gram -Schmidt. It is. It will, it, the process constructs an orthonormal basis, but it may not Absolutely. be complete. So. If Absolutely. it's not complete, it doesn't have the square shape you want in, certain, in a certain sense, right? So yes. what for uh, math for wisdom, you know, which is um, uh, your talk is, uh, uh, you know, uh, hosted by. Uh, and so the yes. question is, um, how do we run up against the limits of the imagination? But it's like a division of everything. So, for example, into two yes. perspectives. And so when I look at that, when I think of that, I go, oh, there's one thing like a nilpotent matrix that's collapsing Absolutely. things. It's saying that uh, there's yeah. a certain amount of collapse, which may not be total, at least in the Gram-Schmidt case. And so that's this idea like, well, there could be a question. Does it exist? Does it not? It's That's a perspective that's taken given. But there's another, okay. let's say it's an orthogonal like rotation, which says yeah. everything is taken care of. It's the way it is. It's reversible or whatever, right? And so there's a distinction yeah. in two points of view. Now, if you push that further, and of course you're doing it in a more abstract setting where you're, uh, you're moving away from the matrix algebra and you're showing that it can be in a um, Lee, Lee theory world. But yes. you're saying, well, there are more sophisticated uh, decompositions. Uh, so, for example, the Iwasawa uh, composition, where, where now you can do it into three parts or you're even doing it into four parts. Yes. And so uh, that's exciting for me because I think uh, those are examples of where the mind is carving up different ways you know, of looking at things or some, you know, somehow that kind of carving up is uh, uh, available. And one of the things I noticed was um, that you can think of it, you mentioned compact subgroups. So the yes. rotational part is like a compact subgroup. Subgroup, yes. But there's also a translation, I would think. There's a like an yes. upper triangular translation, which is non-compact. That is, that is the new thing. Yes, and so that's true. the nilpotent part. So that's yes. interesting that um, whatever you're talking about these particles, but they have these different ways of looking at them, that there's a compact Absolutely. way of looking at them and there's a non-compact way of looking at them. So when I think yes. of non-compact, I'm thinking of the infinite space, you know, that it could be moving in. And if I think it's of the compact, dynamic. if you have the relative perspective around which it could be moving, then in addition, you have this abelian uh, perspective uh, which is somehow reshifting things, you know, reshifting, it's kind of scaling the dimensions appropriately, let's say. Absolutely. And then you're saying there's a fascinating fourth way of looking at it, where uh, it's telling you basically what's the nature of this uh, particle. And Absolutely. so when I have this fourfold um, division of everything, as I do with the Yoneda embedding, you know, whether, what, how, why, it starts to suggest like, well, whether would be this... Uh, like you call it the affine structure constant is whether the particle is, but maybe like uh, what the particle is or how the particle is has to do with translations or rotations. And then why the particle is would be, let's say you have to have the right scaling to make everything all fit. I'm just inventing, you know, yeah. the kind of way my mind works. It's, it's very true. Very, uh, 
is that the inward decomposition is actually an extension of the Gram-Smith octagonalization process. So it is very true what you are explaining. And um, we are just doing it in the legal perspective and mm -hmm. in an abstract form too, yes. And so uh, we just have a few minutes and then we'll return for the grand uh, yes. finale. But uh, in those minutes, um, I want to say, so something that comes to mind for me is uh, I noticed in the Pauli matrix case that when you yes. exponentiate them, you yes. get three different kinds of rotations. So for example, you showed here, you get the... Uh, uh, trigonometric rotation yes. using, a, let's yes. say, a, the real numbers. But mm -hmm. also, you would get, um, uh, now you use real numbers here, but like if there's a way of, you know, sometimes you would use a e to the i, let's say, theta, or yeah. e to the i, let's say, alpha, mm -hmm. right? Well, e to the i yeah. alpha is a way of talking about uh, rotations in the complex uh, yes. world. But yes. then the third Pauli matrix, if you exponentiate that, you get um, uh, rotations using quaternions. And so if yes. you take a unit vector, uh, I'm not sure that's true here, but maybe it is. Um, it's just a bit beyond me. But so I became interested to think, oh, I should ask you, uh, is there a way to decompose something like a... SU2 or or where you're using these three yes. rotations and does it have any kind of significance? Yes, SO2, SU, SU2 can be decomposed using the polar decomposition and it's it's works. Um, it doesn't become Iwasawa because for Iwasawa you would have to look at um, the matrices having an upper triangular. Um, that is a, um, a, a, a upper triangular matrix form or basis then also having a diagonal and also having a rotational form. But SU2, because of the Pauli structure, can also be decomposed. We call it the polar decomposition, which is also feasible. But it is not exactly the Iwasawa decomposition. And so would that be particular to SU2 and like to three dimensions or? or... Yes, that is particular to the SU2, the polar decomposition. And that's kind of, so, I mean, this is uh, my strange you know, thing, my strange peculiar interest, but so the idea like the learning cycle, you know, like that yeah. you make a stand, you follow through, you reflect, yeah. it could be rotating through the different ways of thinking of a rotation. And the nice way, the, the nice way, the nice thing about modeling it this way is that it becomes then very apparent, uh, the permutative quality to say, it's kind of like, oh, uh, I talked with Thomas earlier today, just about human communication that, we don't know what's in another person's mind. And so in Absolutely. a certain sense, you know, but we, we, um, but for example, we maybe know that we can figure out that we all have a learning cycle, but when we try to Very match true. those learning cycles, like is he his real number? Maybe I use the complex numbers in the way he uses the real Absolutely. number. Maybe I talk Absolutely. about taking a stand, but he means taking action, following through. That we'll never be able to maybe figure out because, um, so, so then that would be, so the idea is that one kind of decomposition would have one way, uh, you know, one purposefulness, let's say, but you're dealing with this other, which seems like a fourfold decomposition, yes. which is of a different that, that purpose. Is, yes, that is when I'm considering the um, fine structure constant. I'm, 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 I'm choosed by that because of the behavior of particles. I think particles have, um, is a Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian structure are mostly quaternion, quaternions. And I'm looking in the future to look at the transcendence of the fine structure constant. Because I believe that there is a way we can match the uh, fine structure constant with the exponentials and with the Hamiltonian. Like the way mathematicians have matched the I, complex number I, the exponential and the pi. So to give the more risk or the Euler identities. So I believe there is a way I, that the structure constants and the exponential and um, Hamiltonian can also be matched to make the discrepancies in physics uh, very little because there are certain things, no matter what, it, it will never change. Like the fine structure constant is one, 137 or one over 137 and it, it will never change it will never change. It will remain so or until, until infinite time. 
Yes. So it is it is good when we have a way to normalize it or to make it a fixed value like the plank, like the pi or like the exponential. Yes. So the final stage, which is is spinning in mathematics, the spin the same as the spin j in particle physics. From our previous review that we've done so far, we've noticed that the spin in geometry is a Clifford algebra. And for a particle, it is true that particles admit the structure of a Clifford algebra. They are almost complex manifold. They also have a spin group structure, but they are never the same as the spin group in mathematics. This can be taken when we look at the following two examples. In mathematics, spin three is isomorphic or it maps into the SO3. So they say it's a double cover of the SO3 group. Now, in particle physics, when we look at the structure in the propositions that we argued above and the lemma with theorems, the SO3 would move, would be in the SL3C, classical matrix. And this is just a spin one, which is a boson. So spin one is SO3, which is a boson. And spin three in mathematics is an SO3. So the two are never the same. Similarly, when we consider the spin two, the spin two in mathematics is having the structure of the SU2 or the SO2, which is a double cover. However, in physics, the SO2 can be found in the SL2C, which is also from the spin half, which are fermions. So the two groups of spins will never be the same. They will never be the same, and they can never have the same property as it is argued by physicists and mathematicians when they deal with the standard model and the gauge theory. Because when I consider if I can allow the pen to write, let me see. When I consider the SU2, let me choose a different color. This, I think. So the SU2, the SU2, which is, the SU2, okay, this one. SU oh, now we see, we see, yes. The SU5 is isomorphic to the SU3. Cross products of the U1, SU1, sorry, let me clean this side. Cross products of the SU1, the SU2, then cross products of the U1, which is the standard model. But it is clear that we can see that the SU3 is a spin one because it's coming from the bosonic side. It's a boson. The SU2 is coming from the spin half. When I proved the compact rel from the complexification of the SL2, and the U1 is the Higgs boson. So from this, I have noticed that it will be difficult to accept that um, the particle in spins are just the same as the particles, the spins in geometry, mathematics and geometry. 
But I see physicists and mathematicians using it interchangeably, which, which created a lot of concern. And I decided to research into this structure of spin particles. And I noticed the two are never the same. They can never be the same. So what I believe is that the spin particles should be treated as a matrix on its own, because when we take a spin half, it is a two by two matrix. When I take a spin three over two, it's a four by four matrix. When I take a spin five over two, it is a six by six matrix. When I take a spin one, which is a boson, spin one is a three by three matrix. Spin two, which is a graviton, would also have a six, um, a, 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 I think that would be a five by five. So the structure of the matrices in particles are a bit unique and they have specific Lie algebraic structure um, rules that they obey. And looking at this, the two structures, their gauge group and their representations, their Krebs Gordon coefficient should not be mixed up when mathematicians and researchers and physicists are looking at the gauge and the standard model because it will create a lot of inconsistencies and it will mm -hmm. make the result very untrue. So this, this is where my talk ends. And I think for me to clean this, uh, let me try <laughs> yes. to do it. Yes. yes. Oh, good. I have in, in the talk, we we consider we provided an extension of the semi the semi simplicity of spin particle Lie algebra to the Lie group level. We also show that a spin particle Lie algebra admits a Clifford algebra, and it is also an almost complex manifold and it has a spin Lie group structure. We demonstrated that the spin half particle and the spin Lie group is a fourfold cover of the SO two n. We also proved that any spin Lie group of a spin particle is connected and semi-simple. We constructed the real Lie algebra of the spin half particle. We also performed the Wasawa decomposition of the spin half into the compact, the diagonal, which is abelian, and the nilpotent. Finally, we applied angular momentum coupling to the spin 2n minus 1 particle when we look at the quantum form. The quantum form. And we demonstrated that the octagonal basis transform into the SO2N1. And this is nothing but the Dinkins roots DN. This, this ends the talk. Thank you. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, um, Francis Howard, for your uh, fascinating and, uh, and uh, well-communicated uh, uh, presentation. I would like to ask uh, Professor Thomas Gaidosik of Vilnius University, uh, who has been so kind to uh, join us and, and uh, consider your uh, scholarship, what he might uh, say. Thank you. Uh, yes, my first remark is that finding the gauge group structure represented in spin structures is something where I cannot follow, but if you find some understanding, explanation, or breakthrough, I think that that would be really astonishing. And the other remark that the two, that the mathematical spin and the physical interpretation of spin are different, even though they use the same names, is something that I would fully agree with. And I hope that you can push it into the heads of people who use the same notation for things and don't think that others might consider it in a different context. So I wish you good luck in your urge to clarify the notation between mathematics, mathematicians and physicists. And I wish you really good luck in your search for a way of, in that sense, including gauge group structure constants and the field strength couplings like the alpha to yeah. I, I mean the, to 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 find your 
goal how to to work it out because it's not clear to me how that should work but i mean luckily i'm in that sense not you and you have your goal to reach it which has to be uh challenging others otherwise others would have found it so i wish you really success in your goal it would be really nice to see something on that thank you thank you very much professor thomas yeah that that is true we it's also really a challenging yes. yes okay you can talk. we also okay. wish you success in um, your future career you know in finding <laughs> attractive postdoc appointments uh and you've just to say uh how remarkable uh african science is you know that you're uh, you're just a wonderful uh, demonstration of the contributions that uh, are being made and so that you be able to uh, venture outward into the world and return to Africa as you choose. And so I just want to uh, say that so, uh, we're very privileged. Uh, and uh, you see that we we understood this is a special occasion. Um, and I want to um, say, oh, so on behalf of my uh, colleague, John Harland, who I... Uh, whose passion of, for physics is just boundless. Uh, he, I'm sure he would ask uh, about the fine structure constant. Uh, he is um, curious about uh, evolution in physics. So I think that would be an example, like how could the fine structure constant have evolved, right? Among other things. And so I want to see, do you have any inkling of ideas uh, when you have this decomposition, how that could, uh, relate to what evolution of the physical world could be like okay okay with with the evolve of the um, the fine structure constant i noticed that from the papers I've, i read and from research from soma field and from uh, Ed, editing atta and other research researchers and co data results that are currently available. I have mm -hmm. seen that it comes basically from angular momentum coupling and also from experimental physics. But the physicists are not really much enthused by the coefficients of these structures. They only get very enthused when the results they are searching for are perturbed by those particles and they don't get what they really want as decided. So. I, I am seeing it as something that needs to be resolved like the pi and like the uh, exponential functions. It, I think it's a transcendence number. I have a proof which is being developed on this. And very soon, I'm sure in about a year or two, I should come out with a transcendental structure of the fine structure constant. Yes, I'm that, trying to switch that to the transcendental number. I applaud your... Um... Wonderful boldness, and I applaud uh, what you're uh, doing. Uh, your uh, your real um, uh, holding on, you know, and and, and mm -hmm. embracing these huge uh, questions in physics uh, with such um, determination in your studies. You know, it's clear how many things you've learned, which is one reason I'm attracted to study along with you. And you mentioned pi and e, and it's just fascinating to think like that. The same evolutionary processes that could lead to the fine structure constants could also be defining pi and e because it's not, uh, you know, why can't they be products of evolution? It's just not clear where they're coming from. But um, in kind of like uh, championing my own perspective, this wondrous wisdom, as I call it, uh, see, so if the decomposition is reflecting whether, what, how, why, it's kind of starting to become clear, like, um, the translation and the rotation are this practical everyday world of what and how, right? But the yeah. other two worlds are the fine structure world and the abelian world. Absolutely. And the abelian world, I suspect, is some kind of rescaling that uh, makes the two dimensions uh, have the proper relationship, right? Something like that. Yeah. So you see, those are the divine uh, aspects of the... And Absolutely. we usually probably don't, you know, we kind of think that they're set or whatever, but the idea is that what if they have their uh, dynamic, so those would be the two things that are playing with each other, 
the scaling yeah. and the um, what you call the mysterious fine cut structure constant thing. But it could play with that. Like, how do you, you know, what's the relationship between the R and the one over R, you know, et cetera. So I guess that that could be something to bring attention to John. We will definitely be inviting you for an after talk party sometime, I think it towards the end of June next month. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to have everyone study this and have uh, in a more casual atmosphere, uh, be able to invite more casual questions. That would be great. That would be yeah. great. You see, I've my questions are a bit on the casual level, but I've tried to stay uh, with the formal. Um, another fact or question I wanted to ask was, um, oh, oh, what would you name a spin? Because I think one way to uh, proceed would be to give it a, you know, forget about the mathematical spin, but let's say the physical spin. What would you name it to be differently if you could use a different word? Okay. I think with the, with the help of um, um, Professor Rafael Ablamovich, editor mm -hmm. of uh, um, the spin, one of the spin, spin general, uh, Springer General, he, he helped me with that structure. You noticed in my slide, or in my article, the structure of the spin is is a, is a deep black. It's a deep color. Mm -hmm. It's a bold color. Hmm. When you look at yes, a spin is a bold color and it has a, a form of writing. Mm -hmm. So that distinguished it a little bit from the usual um, notations that we 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 have. Mm -hmm. And because the physicists have abused the name and it is a, a lot of things. I noticed, I read back far papers as back as um, 1893 papers. And I noticed they were using the spin half and they were looking at the H, they, they, are look, they were looking at the Planck constant as simplecton. They called it a simplecton. Mm. And they considered this as a geometric quantization. And they did a whole lot of algebra. So I didn't know, I don't really know why they stopped using the form of the spin half and obviously became a usual spin in mathematics and nobody bothers about the structure of the spin of a particle anymore. It's that is mm. what became a bit worrisome to, to me. Mm. Yes. Because in my, I think I have one of my papers that um, is being submitted for publication. It's on particles to periodics, zeta mm. functions of particles. So I'm moving from particles to the, the Q form of the zeta function. So I'm considering the quantum structures, the deformed quantum structures, the zeta, the Egusa zeta functions, and doing a lot of advanced algebra with these uh, spin particles. And, and, yeah. and just for the little I know, that relates to the Riemann hypothesis. Is that correct? The zeta that, function? That, the zeta function remains, it, it is related to the Riemann hypothesis. But that one is a, a hidden agenda I'm taking. I think it will okay. take a lot of years. years to do Good that. for you. My aim, <laughs> my aim was for us. that end. So I'm, I'm hoping for a, a, a bright um, platform to be able to get a good understanding of why Riemann stopped at that hypothesis. When I can get why you stopped at that hypothesis, I can think from that point and see the way forward. Because I noticed everything was definitely lying in that critical real form of the half. And I have a question that would be very appropriate for the after talk party, it's so casual, but yeah. uh, I will ask you just to, because <laughs> okay. I have the impulse. Uh, when I look at the standard model, you know, it has this very curious uh, symmetry, you know, SU3, SU2, yes. U1, yes. of course. So, of course, everyone would think, well, where's, you know, maybe gravity? Is it uh, something like, uh, you know, SU4, you know, or whatever? But when I look at it, and you see, when I compare it to my uh, structures in Wondrous Wisdom, mm -hmm. there's a structure, um, like for the will and God's will, that has like a threefold, mm -hmm. three yes. perspectives extra. Yes. There's a structure for emotional life that is a two extra perspectives. There's a structure for intelligence, let's say that's a one loose uh, extra perspective. There's a structure for needs and uh, ways we deal with things, which has no extra perspectives. Yes. And so I just think according to that, you know, if I was to try to see model that, like I would suspect that gravity would be something like U of zero. 
And the idea is that, you know, so whatever these um, zero dimensional matrices could be, but it's yes. something contradictory. It's something yes. maybe doesn't have slack. And I think mm -hmm. like uh, for gravity, that'd be understandable. It's not supposed to have slack. You know, it's supposed to be tight, yes. right? So, Absolutely. so I was just wondering if this uh, crazy contradictory I'm idea, what would you think about that? Okay, actually from the uh, diagrams leading to the Dinkins diagram that I had for integer for the integer spin, gravity is a spin of two. And the spin of two, meaning when I take spin two, I have from my notation, if n is two, I have SL five, SL five will also be in an SU five. So the gravity, actually pointed out directly to the standard model, which is an SU5 from my model. Mm. And it you... was it is a detailed revelation that I got shocked with. It was the standard model is SU5, which is isomorphic to SU3, SU2, and uh, U1. But the gravity oh. from my, my decompositions, it, it, it points out when I'm to share a little screen. Short. I can explain how that relates to my theory. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that what what you're saying yeah. is that uh, SU five is the standard model and SU five is, is gravity. Is gravity. But what That's I'm it. saying is that except they're two different things. And see, so in order yeah. for them to be the same thing but different things, you have to have this contradictory difference. It's like the Absolutely. identity morphism, like the do nothing yeah. action. The do-nothing action is self-contradictory. It doesn't make sense. Like, why in category theory do you have morphisms that do nothing? It doesn't, you know, no. and 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 it would make it would make sense if you had a bookkeeping system. You know, zero makes sense as a bookkeeping artifice, but yes. zero doesn't make sense as a fact fact about reality. Reality shouldn't have any zeros, right? Absolutely. So what you know, so there's two ways to talk about gravity. You're talking about gravity as a comprehensive physical reality. reality. Whereas if you think of gravity as the fourth force, it would be this mm -hmm. contradictory zero, you mm -hmm. see that, because it's distinct from the other three, right? It's true, it's true. And so it's just completely it's like, it, it's something that we think about, but it doesn't make sense because it's distinct from the Absolutely. other three. How could it be distinct? It's it's the sum of them all. Is that, am I on track? That is what I, that's what I noticed. So I am actually, uh, I've been thinking about it for quite some years now. Why should gravity be SU5? Mm. And why is the standard model also SU5? And I, it helps me understand when Einstein told Gelman that one day his gravitational field equations will be able to predict all elements in it. That's, that's, and you that's said this at the talk uh, that John Baez gave in your question, yes. I think, and I think, or you said it to us in our party, but I, all I remember is that we met at John Baez's talk, We're very grateful for his yeah. wonderful talk and for the opportunity to recognize, oh, I need to find this man and uh, yeah. and connect with him. And uh, so glad that uh, you've been uh, responsive. And so I look forward to studying along with you, trying to understand bot periodicity, other things, your Clifford algebras, Absolutely. other things, you know, spin groups, other things you're so knowledgeable about. Uh, want to extend that invitation to other people to say, we'd like to uh, be able to uh, study this, um, whether in a formal way or in a more casual yeah. way, but uh, in every Absolutely. way. Um, Absolutely. And just to compliment you, congratulate you that you were able to Thank give you. this talk, which is really uh, actually very bold, uh, but very um, classic in terms of uh, exposition, in terms of subject matter. Actually, very uh, Thomas and I talked a little bit about, we prepared a little bit ahead of time what he he said that, you know, this is an, uh, an, an article that the three of you had published in the Springer Journal on a, a, a applied um, Advances in Applied uh, Clifford Algebras. Clifford that... algebra. Yes, so yeah. it's very hands-on. It's very much like something a physicist would like. It's very understandable, so to speak. It's something where you can look, maybe this is another question to ask. Uh, you can look and say, oh, it's not an existence result. You see, it's a result on how algebra is actually functioning. And so yes. somebody like me or anybody can look at it and say, oh, does that give new extra physical intuition? And an yes. example would be, you talked about the Jacobi polynomials, which means all of a sudden mm -hmm. there's a combinatorial element. 
Absolutely. And what would that combinatorial element possibly mean uh, in the case of the, the Jacobi orthogonal polynomials? And the, the, the secret about this is um, the parastatistics of operators, which are the creation and annihilations, they form uh, this, this forms the groups of the particles. You noticed we were having major groups. The spin half was an SL2, mm -hmm. and the spin half at the end of the talk was isomorphic to the SU1. What mm -hmm. is the, that's the special unitary of order one, where we looked at the rotational form of that SU1, we brought the Jacobi. So these forms are all particles generated by the creation and annihilations. And in and that appears in, in the matrix. entries of the matrix. Am I correct? I've heard yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. Is that right? Uh? It's true. So the and entries it, actually mean something. The entries are storing information, really right? I mean, like the entries, this is not just some mathematical tool. It's saying that no, the actual elements of the entries have informational content according to nature Absolutely. in my religion. <laughs> but, I, but I think like, okay. Very true. It is very true. So this uh, exposed a lot of um, things on the particles and even it exposes its quantum structure by looking at its Q deformation, PQ deformation. That was done by um, Bedenhan and uh, a lot of mathematicians and physicists have done that, PQs, um, binomial PQs, the combinatorial of PQs. And I see all this in the particle. And that is what my other paper is, has, you, is about. Have you, have you learned the combinatorics of the Jacobi polynomials or not yet? Have you? I, I have learned the um, combinatorics in general, from the Gaussian to the Quince to Ben Okay, but the particulars to... of the Jacobi, do you know or not? Or the, not, not, not the exact details, but I know how to manipulate a Jacobi polynomial. Precisely. So what, uh, just to add, and this is maybe something where I could actually contribute, you know, we could learn together, but I've yeah. been uh, with John Harland and, um, you know, with with uh, explaining also to Thomas on occasions, yes. I've been studying the uh, combinatorics of the orthogonal uh, Schaeffer polynomials with the idea mm -hmm. that uh, they are the solutions uh, to, um, they come up as solutions to the Schrodinger's equation. So, for example, the Hermite right. polynomials are for right. uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator. Laguerre Absolutely. polynomials are for hydrogen atom type I, situations. I, I, uh, yes. Charlier polynomials seem to come up. And so the idea is that um, I would add a law of physics saying that uh, uh, solutions of the Schrodinger equation that are physical have to be orthogonal. Uh, uh, yes. Schaeffer polynomials. I mean, they have to be Schaeffer polynomials, not just orthogonal, but Schaeffer polynomials, which means that they, uh, the combinatorics is that uh, they are like uh, partitions of sets. Now, the Jacobi polynomials are not orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials, so they are not yes. solutions, but they may be uh, playing a different role. And so all of a they, sudden, we really have these different combinatorial objects with different, and we can start to analyze, well, how are, you know, what are their roles? So I look forward to studying you with, with you with that because that's all known and that's just something we can say. The, the role they were playing actually was just the role of spherical transforms. Okay. And, yes, and that 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 is actually the the reason why I studied Klebsch Gordon coefficients for my thesis. Yeah, was I I noticed all the spherical Fourier transforms were some sort of polynomials, Jacobi, octagonal, Hermite, but it, it, it's, it's, it does something unique. And that unique thing always carry the coefficients. And I think my supervisor then, the one who supervised me, was fascinated about Klebsch Gordons, how they mm -hmm. meet, how it comes from physics to mathematics. He was a bit confused in the physical sense when he sees the the angular momentum coupling because he understood it from the league group perspective. And when I took on that research, I have been able to lift the results, see how it behaves from the physical to spherical in league oh. groups. That, that, and does this cool. relate to the Legendre polynomials as well or not? Yes, yes it's okay. they are Legendre, spherical. Okay, very interesting. And so, um, Let's see. Uh, oh, maybe you could just summarize uh, because now I feel like I understood forty-five percent of your talk. You know, you're a wonderful uh, researcher, um, visionary, and expositor. But maybe so I could reach maybe fifty-five percent. 
Could you just conclude with your explanation, like what is your understanding currently? What is a particle? Okay. From my understanding, a particle is a matter or antimatter. But this also can have dark matter. But in all this, there must be a fermion, a boson, or a hex. And to be fermion, you have to obey Fermi Dirac statistics, and you must have an, a half integral. You, have, you should be an odd integral, an odd half integral. And when we say odd half integral, we are considering only the positive side of the odd numbers. And for a boson, it should be an integer, but positive integer spin particles. And for a hex, it is always a zero integer. And, and that's the main point, is that right? Yes. And I will, so now I will share some of my also uh, understanding of, because uh, in, in this wondrous wisdom, an exercise that I did was to uh, survey the ways of figuring things out in mathematics. And there's a beautiful 24-fold structure, uh, but it's suggested that there should be four kinds of geometries related to four kinds of logics, let's say, you know, in relations between a, a level and a meta level, you know, are they the same or are they completely different or are they intermediary uh, relations? So I became very interested, why are there four classical Lie groups algebras? You know, why those four? Because I suspected that, uh, and partly because of John Baez's writings, that they must be grounding four different types of geometries, right? And they do seem to ground like four different types of rotations. So you have uh, rotations in uh, quaternions. Uh, you have the rotations in, the, let's say, the complexes. You have rotations in odd and even, and they're different. Because when you have a, because rotations in the reals, I'm sorry, uh, they come in two by two matrices. Absolutely. So if if they're even, that's nice. If they're odd, you will have an extra fixed dimension. Yes. So that's why you have four kinds of rotations, which in the compact cases, which is suggesting four kinds of geometry. But I chase, so I've been chasing down different ways, like, you know, what's, what are those? But the most, uh, one of the most fundamental ways uh, is looking at the root systems. When you look at the root systems, they have the, they look like differences, like Xi minus Xj. If you look at the simple roots, it'd be like, let's say, Xi plus one minus X sub I, right? Uh, except, and so in the, in the, in the most simple case, which is the, uh, complex case, which is the, um, uh, unitary case, the plain vanilla case, uh, a sub n, let's say, that's all you have. It's the simple roots would be a, x sub i plus one minus x sub i. In yes. the other three cases, you have extra widgets on one end. Okay. You can have different things. And the question is, what's going on? And so the answer I got, uh, and I'd have to maybe write this up and work it out, but, it's, but the answer is that what the plain vanilla case is coding combinatorially, it's the symmetry, it's the duality of counting. Whenever yes. you count forwards, you're also counting backwards. So there's Absolutely. this like two channel duality. There's a symmetry of counting and it's modeling that. But you could also have a symmetry of counting by a few other ways. So you could fold it and double it. And if you folded it, then when you fold it, going one way and then coming out the other way, it multiplies by two, basically. That's a symplectic case. So symplectic is basically you folded that. And the reason I say this, the reason I say this is that when you look at the extra roots that you're adding and you say, okay, I have extra root xi, but that's xi minus zero, let's say, right? Or I have extra root two xi. Well, that's really xi minus xi. I mean, xi minus negative xi. Absolutely. See? So when you have xi minus negative xi, it's saying that you took your thread and you cut it in half. Yes. And then you connected it, you see? And now, yes. now you're, the forward and the backward are now connected. They weren't before. Before they were just uh, parallel. 
But Absolutely. what you did by cutting it and connecting it is not, and see, the way to think about it that a grade school child would understand is like, how do you count the years, let's say, before and after Christ? How do you count historical years or, or, or any date, let's say? There's, the ways are, is like you can, you have, go, you're counting backwards and you're counting forwards. You don't have to have a zero, year zero. You could just go negative three, negative two, negative one, one, two, three. Yes. Or you could have an extra zero. So if you have that extra dimension, you have an external zero. In the other case, you just uh, fuse it. Actually, and I think the way you would have to have an internal zero. I think the way it works is that you would have a negative three, negative two, negative one equals one. One and negative one would be the same thing. That's because if it was negative one, one, that's folding. See, that would it's be true. folding. But it's if you true. have a negative two negative one equals one two three that's fusing or you can have uh cutting and extending with a zero and that's the four cases so it's childishly simple and I, I like it a lot but see what it's saying in your case it's saying b sub n sequence d sub n sequence are the real case the orthogonal case the so2n mm -hmm. case or so2n yeah. plus one case maybe but they're coming from cutting it and I think it's if it's a if it's odd, it's a fermion, I guess. So then you're adding an external yeah. zero, which means you're Thank adding you. some kind of external uh, absolute reference frame. But in the boson yes. case, they don't have an ex absolute reference frame. They just have their own frame, yeah. something like that. Does that make yes. sense? So I think it fits it makes, what you're makes, talking I mean, it could yeah, relate to what you're talking it about. Well. It fits well because I, I really, when I'm dealing with particles, I actually don't look critically at the boson because... I can get every boson from a fermion. Hmm. I add two fermions and it's a boson. Okay, so we'll leave it here. I want to ask uh, Thomas to end us with any comments we have in a prayer, most importantly. Thank you, Thomas. I cannot really do any comments, but I would like to, uh, uh, to thank you first for the prayer that you did last time. Thank you. So I, I felt really... It felt really nice and good. And today I want to thank God that you could give us this introduction and presentation, could explain your thinking and also your goals. And I ask the Lord that he gives you his spirit, that you are emboldened to go on the journey for truth and also this goal to help others understand what you find fascinating. Amen. You have the patience that you explain it to others in a way that they can understand and Amen. that you're not frustrated if all your ideas are not understood immediately. So I really ask you for this grace of being able to wait for the understanding because it might take some time and that you're not just letting go because it's too difficult but that you carry on and I ask also Mary that she takes care also of your well-being and in some way of your career so that you can really devote yourself to your goals and not have to worry about in that sense the physical Amen. Way, 